Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's service. If you're a visitor, a warm welcome to you especially, and to our family and friends from Trinity Bible Church. Um, trust that today's service will speak to your heart. Um, more importantly, that you will listen and respond to the Word of God and to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray and commit the service to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for today, and we thank you that as we gather together in your name, you are with us, you by your Holy Spirit are speaking to us, and you moving in our midst. You long for us to be passionate, obedient Christ followers. And so, Lord Jesus, may we grasp the truths of the Christian faith with ever-growing maturity and deeper understanding, and may that translate into a life um, full of praise and worship to you and full of action that is spurred on by the Spirit of God moving in our hearts and in our lives and in our churches so that we truly can live as ambassadors of the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us. We thank you that you died for us. We thank you that you saved us from a lost eternity. We thank you that you have given us the gift of eternal life. And we rejoice because of that. Because of your gift of life to us, we, we are given strength and we can go through difficult times because you strengthen us and you are with us and you give us peace and you give us joy in the midst of heartache and sorrow and difficulty. Lord, be with each person in um, our church this morning who may be suffering from some form of illness and bring healing to their bodies, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray for those who are struggling emotionally and mentally and, and really feeling the weight of, of the isolation of COVID-19 upon them. Lord, today bring a fresh touch, a fresh sense of your joy into their hearts, a, a real quickness in their step um, and a vibrancy that can only come from you and, and the Spirit of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, folks, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 15, essentially covering aspects from verse 1 through to verse 33. Um, we had a tremendous service last week, our celebration, our one-year celebration as a church, and um, just the opportunity to gather together. Um, this was our first opportunity under lockdown, and so we're still rejoicing from that moment. Um, a time of thanksgiving, a time of remembering what God has done for us, and appreciating His goodness um, and the way He has sustained us throughout this year as a church, even though we haven't been able to meet regularly face to face. So it was a special time and um, look forward to the next year that God has in store for us. And hopefully there will be less lockdown and more face to face time and more opportunity for ministry, opportunity to, to get involved with our missionaries, to go and visit some of them, opportunity to, to start new works on the South Coast, um, ministry amongst the schools. We're praying that that would start up again and that I'd have the opportunity to go and do assemblies again. And, um, and we're praying for an open door at a, um, an orphanage up in the REV Flats called Inati. And um, we're praying for an opportunity there for me to go weekly and minister to the teenage boys. So we believe that God will be opening doors in this way. In the, in the months to come. Now, the subject, as I've said, is marks of spiritually healthy Christians. So you see, spiritually healthy Christians are not old Christians. They're not spiritually healthy because they've been Christians for a long time. The reality is there are many Christians who have been Christians for years, maybe even half a century but they're still immature in the faith. And the sad reality is there are even those in churches who have been Christians for years and who have grown into positions of leadership. But unfortunately, they have the maturity, the spiritual maturity of a toddler. And that's sad to see because that can be hugely problematic. It can make churches dysfunctional because there are Christ followers who love the Lord but they're just not mature. 
And if you're not maturing the faith, you are more easily prone to being tossed about by all sorts of views and thoughts and ideas. And your own spiritual walk and standing before God will be relatively shallow. God wants us to move from the milk, eating on the milk and drinking of the milk of our faith. And he wants us to move on to the solid food, to start to chew on the meat to start to understand the disciplines and the doctrines of our faith so that we embrace those things and they become part of us. And because of that, we are not easily swayed later on. So this issue of maturity is vitally important, but I'd, I'd rather focus on the word healthy because that's what God wants from us. Healthy Christians, Christians who are growing in their walk with the Lord. That's what makes you healthy. If you're stagnating, you're not healthy. And so healthy Christians, healthy churches. You see what's happening in, in, in Romans 15, Paul is commending the right kind of spiritual behavior from those who are growing mature and healthy in their faith life. And he's saying, this is good. This is what it should look like. This is what I want you to do. And he's commending it to, to, to the church in Rome. And he's saying, live this way. And your church is going to be healthy. You're going to be healthy. And guess what? Lives are going to be touched by the good news of the love of Jesus Christ for lost sinners. So it starts off with this point. Taking on the troubles of the troubled. You see, Jesus took on the troubles of the troubled. Spiritually mature and healthy believers take on the troubles of the troubled and build them up. That's what we've got to do. Verse 1 and 2, Romans 15 verse 1 and 2 says the following. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Then it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And so that little phrase, build him up, we are to build others up and we build others up by sometimes having to take on the troubles of the troubled and Paul is referring also here to to weaker believers we who are strong refers to believers who confidently trust that the religious rules they observed prior to becoming Christians are no longer necessary and that they have a clear conscience about that and that they confidently trust in what Jesus did for them on the cross. However, Paul says that the strong must bear with the failings of the weak. And so the strength of the, um, of the, of the mature believer, the healthy believer, is not to be flaunted over somebody else, as we've said, as we looked at Romans chapter 14. We don't flaunt our strength over those who are supposedly weaker. Now, Paul expects the strong believer to be willing to restrict their own freedom for the sake of the weaker believer. This is an opportunity for the strong to demonstrate the love of Christ and the unity of the Spirit. You see, folks, strong believers should not assert what they are entitled to do ahead of how their conduct will affect others. You may be entitled to do something, but that Paul is saying, you can't assert that. You need to rather take on the troubles of the troubled. That's the heart Paul wants from us. Don't flaunt your freedom, but take on the troubles of the troubled like Jesus did. You see, verse 2 shows us that we must see our weaker brethren as neighbors. And what does he say about us? He says we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So we have to see them as neighbors and that we have a responsibility and a spiritual obligation and a, a, a directive from the Bible to build them up, not to tear them down. To help them with their troubles. Being neighborly to them then is a much higher value than being legally right or entitled or asserting your freedom. And that's what Jesus is trying to emphasize and or sorry Paul is trying to emphasize but he also highlights the fact that that's what Jesus did look at verse 3 for Christ did not please himself but as it is written the reproaches of those who reproached you 
fell on me. Christ did not please himself, folks. We've got to appreciate that. He was willing to take on the troubles of the troubled. The next four verses in that, in that um, from verse 1 through to 7, the, the last four verses, are saying that we must be so united with Christ that we completely model his behavior. We are commanded to live in such harmony with each other that our unity brings glory to God. When we have that kind of harmony and our unity brings glory to God, people look and say, wow, what's going on there? They have an ability to be united even when they struggle to, to always see eye to eye. And even when they have differences of opinions, they still stand together. And the stronger take on the troubles of the weaker. Wow, that's impressive. So, how willing are you to take on the troubles of the troubled within the body of Christ? Will you set aside your own agenda for the glory of God and for the growth of your fellow believers? Maybe it's time to think of someone that you need to bear with. Bear with the weaker brother, even though it may mean sacrifice on your part. You see, spiritually healthy and mature believers take the troubles of the troubled, take them on, and they help to build them up. That's the key phrase. Build each other up in the Lord. Now, the second point is joy and peace is only found in Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 13 says it this way. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Folks, Christians are meant to be hope-filled people, joy-filled people. We're meant to be that. Because we have this eternal reward, we've got our names written in heaven, God's busy preparing a mansion for us there, and we're going to live with him in eternity forever. We should be rejoicing. You see, we may be downtrodden, but we live with an entirely different set of values as Christians. Our expectations regarding life and eternal life have completely been turned around. And we, now, we no longer live for this life, we live for the next life. As hopeful believers, we see death as the door to perfect joy and peace in Christ Jesus. Right now, we know that we experience that joy and peace in, in a partial way because our flesh and our struggles with the flesh continue. However, perfect joy and peace are part of our future hope and that gives us courage to face each new day while we're still on earth. You see, healthy and mature believers are not ruled by the troubles of life. But instead, when the troubles of life come, they quickly run to God for strength in those difficult times. And they find their joy and peace in Him alone. Okay, now the third point. The essential qualities of believers in healthy churches. Romans chapter 15 verse 14 to 17 says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God. And then he says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. He's been given grace by God to be this minister to the Gentiles. So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Here's a question. Are we a healthy church? Is Trinity Bible Church a healthy church? We one year old. But are we a healthy church? Well, it depends entirely on whether we have healthy believers in our church. And the reality is we'll have a mixture of believers. Some healthy, some not so healthy. But if there are predominantly healthy people in the church, it means 
that the, the weaker believers who are not that healthy will be motivated, will be encouraged, and, and they will have people walk alongside them to help them grow and mature in a considerate way. All right, so in verse 14, Paul reveals that he is satisfied with the believers in Rome. Now, this indicates that they are, by and large, mature believers. He's satisfied with them. They're obviously doing something right. They must be relatively strong in the faith and technically, therefore, not weak in the faith. But the fact that he's mentioned all these aspects of strong and weak and and what it really means to live by the Spirit and yield your life to the Spirit and, and the differences of, of opinions about things shows us that there still are issues. Issues never completely go away. And so what are the marks, these essentials? Well, first of all, a healthy believer is full of goodness. A healthy church is full of goodness. A healthy believer, healthy believers are filled with all knowledge. See what it says there. They are filled with all knowledge. Filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Because you're filled with all knowledge, you're able to instruct one another. Now, I am very cautious because I constantly tell people it's not about knowledge, it's about obedience. But folks, I need to always remind you that you don't get obedience without the appropriate, correct knowledge. So obedience is technically applied knowledge. So you don't just do obedience in a vacuum of no knowledge. We need the Word of God to inform our obedience. Okay, so healthy believers are full of goodness, like their good father, filled with knowledge because they steep themselves in, themselves in God's Word. And because of that, they are able to instruct one another. So those are the first three points. Now, in verse 16, he says, So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That phrase, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, this echoes the terminology of Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, where Paul urges them to offer their bodies as what? Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, as their spiritual act of worship. So our fourth essential quality of believers in a healthy church is that they are obedient to God's word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Obedient to God's word through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This is what brings about the sanctification of the saints. We can never grow more sanctified, which means Set apart for Christ only, because that's essentially what sanctified means. I've been set apart solely for Christ and for his use and for his glory. So we can never grow more sanctified if we don't obey the Bible and if we don't yield to the Spirit's conviction in our lives. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we have to repent. That's how we become more sanctified. That's how we grow and mature in the faith. So the question is, are we really a healthy church? And are you a healthy believer? Well, these are four markers and essentials with regards to that. Now, our fourth point. Mature and healthy Christians are always available to God. See, Romans chapter 15, verse 17 to 21 says, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will 
understand. Paul does not boast in himself. He only boasts in Jesus. However, he's not unaware that God is using him as a vessel for his gospel purposes. And in that context, Paul is proud of his work for God. He's proud of his work for God in Christ. In other words, God must get the glory for his own work. Because it's his own work. Anything we do for Christ is his work. It's not us. It's him working in and through us. Yet we get to feel the satisfaction and joy of being well used by the master for the master's purpose. Notice Paul elaborates in verse 18 that he only speaks about what Christ has done through him. Paul does not self-promote or regale his hearers about his own personal accomplishments. Only that which is done for Christ will last. Anything else is of the flesh, people. And Paul knows that full well. Romans chapter 15 to 21, Paul describes um, well, it, it describes Paul's regular missionary practice of preaching the gospel and planting churches only in places where other missionaries have not previously worked. His heart is to reach the unreached people groups of this world. This is the reason, as a church, as Trinity Bible Church, we need to support missions both locally and abroad. In other words, in foreign countries, in Africa, in North Africa, in Asia, wherever the Lord leads us, and also locally. And so we must go either ourselves to these places, or we must send others by providing them with the resources they need and the support they need and the, the prayer backing they need, so that these types of outreach into other places, just like Paul did, can take place. So when we think about that for a moment, we are obligated to be willing vessels in the hands of an almighty God. We're obligated to be willing vessels. I mean, mature and healthy Christians are always available to God. What's your availability like right now? Are you available to God or do you have conditions to that availability? Or do you readily just say, here I am, Lord, send me, use me. Ask God to show you ways that you can either go into the field or as you stay, ask him to show you ways that you can support missions that reach out to unreached people groups. But at the same time, say, Lord, help me to live as your disciple, as an ambassador for you at home, at work, in my recreation, amongst my family, amongst colleagues and friends. Help me to be that ambassador, because when you're doing that, you are showing your availability to God, to be used by God, to be a vessel for God. And our fifth point, our final point for this morning's sermon is, are you a consumer or a contributor? Now, right now, I'm about to consume some coffee. Mm, very good. Are you a consumer or a contributor? And what does that question even imply? Well, let's first look at Romans chapter 15, verse 25 through to 27. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. Now, we know from chapter 1 that Paul was longing to visit the church in Rome and the believers in Rome. But he had been held up and he had other responsibilities that he couldn't just leave until they were finished. Then he says, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and, and Achaia have been blessed to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. You want to underline something? Underline, make some contribution. For they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be of service to them in material things. When we follow Jesus and people come to know Christ, we share in the blessing of having come to faith in Christ. And then we need to share in the body of Christ. 
And that little phrase, make a contribution, that's an important phrase. Here's the question. Are you a consumer or a contributor? Are we meant to just consume, which would make us fat Christians? Or are we meant to contribute, which would make us active, obedient Christians? You see, the word contribution in verse 26 is the word koinonia in Greek and literally means fellowship. This indicates that these churches, were, these churches, namely Macedonia and Achaia, were extending financial fellowship to the needy in the church at Jerusalem. You see, fellowship is so much more than gatherings and meals together. It includes that. True fellowship costs us something, and it requires dedication and commitment. This reminds me of John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Too many people come to church to consume. It's all about themselves. It's what they can get out of it. But we are meant to consume in order to contribute. So I am not saying stop consuming. <laughs> we must consume. We must consume the word of God. We must pray. We must hear from other teachers and preachers. We must grow in our faith. We must consume. But we must consume in order to contribute. Not just to get full and fat. Because the reality is, if we just consume, we will not be healthy Christians. Consumption feeds our spiritual appetite, but contribution makes us spiritually effective and healthy. The two work together in balance with each other. So we are all meant to be contributors, folks, within the local body and within the larger body of Christ. Whether we're helping to meet needs in the church locally or we're helping to send missionaries abroad, whatever it is, we are to contribute to the needs of the body of Christ. What needs to change in your life in order to make you more of a contributor and less of one who just sits back and consumes? Spiritually mature believers are healthy because they consume and contribute. So let's wrap it up. What have we said so far in conclusion? We've said that spiritually healthy believers take on the troubles of the troubled and build them up. We've said that healthy and mature believers are not ruled by the troubles of life, but run quickly to God for strength in difficult times. They find their peace and their joy and their strength in Christ alone. And then we had a look at the essential qualities of believers in a healthy church, which include they're full of goodness, they're filled with knowledge, in other words, they have consumed, but they're also able to share that with others and instruct one another. And then obedience flows out. They are obedient to the word of God and obedient to the conviction and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Our fourth point was mature and healthy Christians make themselves available to God to be used by him. No matter what age, whether you're young, whether you're old, you can make yourself available to serve God's purposes the way He wants you to serve His purposes at whatever age you're at right now. Finally, spiritually mature believers are healthy because they consume and they contribute. They fill themselves in the Word of God and then they obey the Word of God and they get out there and do the things God's called them to do. So do you want to serve the purpose of God in your generation? You can make a difference if you choose to do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have a deep desire to see us go from infancy to adulthood, from immaturity to maturity, from instability to stability in Christ, from people who flounder when trouble comes to people who find their peace and joy and strength in Christ when trouble comes. Maturity 
is your work in us as we avail ourselves to you. So help us to grow in Jesus' name so that your name is glorified and that the church grows strong and healthy and serves your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with God, folks, and have a really awesome week.